Okay, thank you all for joining us for our webinar, Water Related Impacts of Cover Crops. I wanted to um, start off with a special thank you to our state conservationist, Carlos, for allowing us the use of our software, hardware, and our time to further advance our mission here at the Soil and Water Conservation Society. We couldn't do it without all the support. And very importantly, we are also thankful for our partnership with Matt Angel and the San Joaquin Valley group of RCDs for their support with whom we are co-sponsoring this webinar. It is my privilege today to present to you a group of extremely talented, talented individuals. First, we have Jeffrey Mitchell. He's a professor and cropping systems cooperative extension specialist with the Department of Plant Services with UC Davis. His research and extension effort involves leading an interdisciplinary team consisting of UC Farm and IPM advisors, campus-based researchers, and 12 farmers in the San Joaquin Valley's west side region that is currently conducting on-farm demonstrations and evaluations of biologically integrated farming practices in the annual cropping systems of our region. An important research component of this on-farm demonstration project involves the evaluation of surface, surface organic mulches in no-till vegetable production systems. He is currently conducting a wide-ranging program in this area to evaluate the effectiveness of these practices for suppressing weeds, improving production efficiencies in terms of nutrient inputs and irrigation water, and for providing optimal soil temperature regimes for crop, crop growth. Along with Alyssa DeVincentes, she's a PhD hydrological sciences. She's the director of the science and technology with Vitador Inc., the developers of the Oakville Bluegrass, which is a unique cover cropping solution, aerial mapping services, and carbon offset projects. They will be presenting along with Anna Gomes, a PhD student, Earth System Science, and Soils and Environmental Biogeochemistry Group at Stanford University. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Jeff, Alyssa, and Anna. Thank you very much. Jeff, I believe you're on mute. You're still on mute, Jeff. OK, I, I apologize there. But listen, I, I thank uh, uh, Brandy, Sonia, and Rob Roy for, for the wonderful opportunity to, to meet with all of you. There are many, many familiar faces out there, and it's nice to see uh, see you all and have this opportunity to share information with you. With my colleagues, uh, Dr. Alyssa DeVincentis, Anna Gomes, Dr. Samuel Sandoval Solis, and uh, Daniele Zachariah, we would like to express just how grateful we are and honored to be part of uh, this meeting this morning and to share aspects of our work with everyone today. We believe that what we've been doing uh, and, and are going to be talking about is quite important. And we are glad that there's interest in learning about uh, what we've been doing among all of you. We, rec we, rec we recognize the importance of the many groups that you are all representing and the individuals here and the work that you're all doing uh out there in similar ways and in a lot of ways i think you'll see that we're truly in this together here our our plan today uh for our time will be to first lay out some background that's related to the types of conservation agriculture systems that we've been working on uh to try to develop information and local applications that are adapted for california and we've been doing this now for quite some time. And we're also going to talk about the roles that cover crops may have in these conservation agriculture systems. Then Anna and Alyssa will share information on water-related implications of cover crops. 
Finally, Alyssa will talk about several very important farm and policy implications of our work on cover crops. And we will make sure that we have time for a very good dialogue, questions, and discussion at the end there. We are all hearing more and more in recent years about regenerative ag systems or conservation ag systems that are known more internationally. And I want to I show these two uh, maps uh, overlays of California here. That's all right. We can go back to that, Anna. That's all right. Uh, just to show the the relatedness, the relevance of Sigma, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, the region that is covered largely by Sigma, and the area on the right where the the research that we're going to be talking about has actually taken place over the last uh, three or four years here. So. There's a commonality to with what we're talking about. And now the next slide, we've been hearing a lot in recent years about some of the, the general buzzwords, regenerative ag, conservation ag, soil health management systems, and emulating natural systems. But in essence, each of these sets of principles, they have very similar components. And, and particularly all the RCD folks and the NRCS folks on the the call this morning will recognize these goals as being very similar. Reducing disturbance, keeping the soil covered, the surface covered, maximizing diversity in various ways within these production systems, and keeping living roots in the soil as much as possible. Developing and adapt adapting these sorts of agricultural production systems has been a large part of what we've been trying to do now for many years. And I know that many folks uh, who are on the call are, this is the bread and butter of what you've been working on as well there. The use of cover crops or crops that are typically grown in between or in addition to a farm's main cash crops for general conservation purposes are an important means for achieving the goals of conservation or regenerative agriculture or soil health management systems. And in particular, cover crops that are grown during the winter cooler and typically higher rainfall window here in California are what we'd like to talk with you about uh, today. To give you a sense of what are largely rain-fed, uh, dry, above-ground biomass production that you can expect to be seeing from these winter period cover crops, we share some data initially from a long term, over 20 years now, study down in the western Fresno County uh, in the west side region, and where you can see that on average about 4,000 pounds or two tons of dry cover crop biomass were produced during the November to March winter window, or a total of about 37 tons of organic matter were added to the soil and the crop production system. Of that, about 40% or 17 tons of carbon were contained in that biomass. Now, to continue our, our story here, Anna will now talk in more detail about some of the specific water-related impacts of cover cropping. Thanks, Jeff. Can you hear me all right? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, great. So, yeah, and, and like Jeff uh, just introduced, first I want to talk about and emphasize that we're discussing cover crops that are grown during the winter season, which in California is the cooler and hopefully wet season. And these winter crop, cover crops that we've been setting are grown between November and March and the off season between cash crops, which is the time period highlighted here um, on the ground. Fresno, California. Anna, I don't, I don't want to interrupt, but um, we can't see the presentation. I, I'm oh. not sure if I'm the only person or. Mm -hmm. That is correct. That is yeah, correct. we're looking at the team view, so we've lost the, the view of the presentation. Uh -huh. Okay, let's see. Um, and thanks everyone for their patience. You know that when we're relying on uh, technology, uh, if there is something that will happen for sure, is that it's going to fail. So. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Can you see it now or? No. Okay, let me try. 
It looks something's loading. <laughs> of course, the only during the practice, you know. Um, let's see. Yep. We're good. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we're good. Thanks. Yes. So we are talking about growing cover crops during the winter season, which in California, like I said, is the cooler and wetter season. And you can see here on the graph of data from Fresno, California, that this time of year, the November to March growing period is the coolest and wettest, and um, the time that plants have the lowest, least evaporative demand and the conditions that don't result in a lot of plant water use. And the majority of cover cropping practices in California occur during this winter time period. So you joined us today to try to learn about all of the mechanisms that are influencing the water impact of cover cropping in California. And you can see there are many different mechanisms and we are going to kind of break down and go into a few of these interactions today. So compared to bare soil surfaces, winter cover crop surfaces, yes, have some measure of transpiration, but also have lower soil temperatures, a reduction of wind speed just above the soil surface, and lower ground heat transfer, which all combine to reduce the water evaporation and raise biological activity. Cover crop soils can also capture dew moisture. And in comparison, non-cover cropped or bare soils also lose water through evaporation and at times can have crested surfaces that lead to sealing, ponding, and runoff. And like I said, we'll go into a few of these um, as we go through our presentation. But first, as Jeff showed already and was discussing, most of our research that was done between the 2016 and 2019 period overlaps, our, our field sites overlap with the area covered in Sigma legislation. So we do feel that our research is, is highly relevant to our discussions around how we're going to kind of um, move forward with Sigma and help to ensure that growers have enough water and crops have enough water. Um, and one of our sites is the one located at Five Points, California. And this is the Westside Research and Extension Center. And it is actually one of the 124 long-term study sites that are part of the Soil Health Institute's broad evaluation of measurement metrics for soil health. And this Five Point site is a super unique location because for 22 years now, it has been studying four different treatment systems. That's conventional tillage with and without winter cover crops and no or reduced tillage with and without cover crops. So we can see over a long period of time how things have changed and how the soil water um, has been impacted with cover crop use. So now we'll start with our first overall question. How do cover crops impact the soil water system? And a quick reminder that we're talking about the winter cover crops that are growing during the cool season from November to March. To start, we will look under our feet and highlight our lab determinations of soil aggregate stability that show increases with cover cropped soils compared to bare or surface, uh, fallow surface soils. And you can see the cover crops is the little C's here in the, the graph. That was aggregate stability. Now we're looking at water infiltration data. And studies show, our studies show that marked increases in the soil's ability to take in water as rainfall or as irrigation in the treatments that were cover cropped. And again, that's the little C's. In addition to other studies having shown that the effectiveness of salt leaching with water has been improved with the same amount of water applied due to the presence of cover crops. So this increased water infiltration. Now moving up to the soil surface, in areas that get more rainfall than we get down here in the central San Joaquin Valley and in our wet years, soils that are covered with winter cover crops are protected from disaggregation, surface crusting, and runoff relative to bare soil surfaces. So we're really increasing the amount of water that is going down into the soil profile um, as, as irrigation or as rainfall. And when cover crops are left on the soil surface, they act as a mulch. And our research, as well as considerable work from other studies, has shown that you can have a reduction of about four inches of soil water evaporation during a typical San Joaquin Valley summer growing period, which is about 13% of an estimated crop evapotranspiration of 30 inches. So it keeps the water in the soil 
after it falls. Next, you may be wondering, but don't cover crops like all plants need water to grow? Well, let's look at the data. Here we have actual ev evapotranspiration and cumulative evapotranspiration evaporation from cover cropped and non cover cropped or this control you can see here on the, the chart graph up here. And these are from our, our long term study site in Five Points, California, and also another study site in Davis, California. And our two kind of main conclusions from these, um, these graphs in this figure is that although Davis and Five Points have very different climates and rainfall patterns, the differences in actual evapotranspiration between the cover cropped and the bare soil surfaces or the control fields is negligible. It amounts to less than an inch of water, which is tiny in the scheme of annual consumptive water use for specialty crop systems. Our second conclusion is even if there is nothing growing on the field in the wintertime, there is still water loss through evaporation in bare soil. So therefore adding a cover crop during a dry year does not increase the actual evapotranspiration by a substantial amount. And in the same study site with our 10, um, our same research study with a different 10 different sites grouped into three different systems, as you can see on the um, X axis here on the graph. We figured out when the soil was saturated with water, so full of water in the winter, and then looked at the end of the cover crop's life cycle and calculated how much water was left in the soil. And you can see that there are no statistical differences between the cover crop in the green and the brown um, control or bare plots. And this data covers the spectrum of water years in California with including the wettest year, 2016, 2017, of our study also back to the drought year in 2017, 2018. And it's important to mention that the precipitation that fell during this data collection was because abundant and frequent rain can actually increase evaporation from bare ground, whereas scarce rain will increase the effect of cover cropping on water use. And we do know that scarce rain is a pattern um, here in California's San Joaquin Valley. So we want to emphasize that these are all wintertime data that we're looking at. So we're talking about how much water the cover crop uses itself. So to answer our second question, don't cover crops use water? Our answer is yes, but it is minimal and due to the improvements of soil quality, physical quality from the cover crops themselves, the soil holds more water, which can then be used by the cover crops to grow. And it is kind of this um, investment in the quality of, of soil as a, as a water bank, as an engineering solution, you can say. So to wrap up our, our water part, in conclusion, from our research findings, we believe that the cover crops are worth the water that they use to grow due to their improvement in soil structure, aggregation, soil biology, soil water infiltration and retention, improved air quality, um, helping with weed management, biological pest controls, amongst many other medium and long-term benefits listed here. Now, Alyssa will um, continue our presentation and end our presentation today by discussing some of the nuances of winter cover cropping. How do we actually adopt them? Thanks, Anna. Um, so our final question, which you may be asking yourself is, is it really that simple? Plant cover crops and save water and save the world? Um, the answer is, of course, no, it's not that simple. Or uh, rather, um, not exactly. There are really important nuances to consider on the subject of cover crop water use. Farms are living, breathing systems, and each field, just like the farmers who work them, has its own unique history, characteristics, and challenges. And these qualities will all have an impact on the results of adopting winter cover crops. So first off, we want to talk about that the management history of your field needs to be recognized. Um, these results are from a study conducted in Solano County with two fields with very different management histories that were only about a mile from one another. The light blue farm had been cover cropped for a decade, while the blue field was just newly planted with a winter cover crop for our experiment. As you're looking down the soil profile, you can see moisture increases markedly up to one meter as you go down. So you can see here that the long-term benefit of cover crops can be significant, but can take several years to accrue. Additionally, um, it's really important to talk about the fact that cover crops are not a, a siloed practice. Um, they're not done 
as one, you know, they're, they're not a decision made in alone. They must be managed really carefully, either tilled in or managed in a no-till environment with specialty equipment. And those choices will affect their water impact. So there's a lot of figures here, but they show the results of the long-term study done at NRI, which was looking at the impact of cover crops and tillage over 20 years. And we compared um, no-till again, or reduced tillage with standard tillage, and we had fields with cover crop and without in Five Points, California. In each of these graphs, the most difference is seen in soil water when you compare those two extremes, your standard tillage without a cover crop to reduced disturbance with a cover crop. In the middle graph, that light green represents the standard no cover crop, a common production system in the San Joaquin Valley, and it has less soil water than the more sustainable dark blue comparative plots, which use reduced disturbance and cover cropping. On the left, you can see the average difference between those systems is circled in green, and it's only about a third of an inch of water. However, when you sum up that water along the soil profile, as you can see on the right, the differences can really add up. The behavior changes as you move down the soil profile, but the difference is most pronounced in this drought year, which we've highlighted from 2017 to 18, when the field received just over four inches of rain. So we believe this data supports the idea that cover cropping and reduced disturbance tillage when used together can really increase a farm's drought resiliency. We've been using the word cover crops, um, but it's important to mention that there are many different species that are going to do different things. Cover crops can vary widely uh, depending on a farmer's management goals. So tall mixes of peas and oats are gonna add substantial biomass to your soil and low lying grasses can suppress weeds and scavenge nitrogen. In some parts of California, the central coast to be exact, uh, cover crops are actually being subsidized based on their nitrogen scavenging ability. So, the main takeaway we want to leave you with here is that every cover crop, whatever species you pick, and every field, wherever you choose to plant that cover crop, uh, is going to be unique. <laughs> and these nuances should be thoughtfully considered in discussions around the water use of cover cropping. History, tillage, species, they're each going to affect how much water is used or saved by a cover crop, but the most significant variable is time because it can take many years for the benefits of cover crops to accrue. In our long-term research study presented today, the plots started showing changes in soil moisture between six and eight years after the beginning of the experiment. Similarly, in our group's recent research covering tomato and almond operations in the Central Valley, we saw differences in behavior between the established orchards that were growing resident vegetation as a cover crop for many years versus the young orchards that planted a cover crop for the first time. All that being said, cover crops should be considered a long-term investment in your farm. Um, something that might be surprising to mention after we've shared all of our exciting information and new research results is that none of this is actually new. Here is some documentation dating back to the 1930s when the NRCS, at the time the Soil Conservation Service, recommended soil management to keep the water where it falls. That's the headline. The fear of erosion dates back many decades, as you can see, or as you may have experienced yourself. And it's as important as ever, but unfortunately, this issue has not garnered the attention necessary to solve the problem in California. So what does all this mean for you? Well, it depends on who you are and, and your relationship to California agriculture. So I want to start off um, talking about growers, people working the land. If you have farms scattered throughout the Central Valley, um, I want you to leave with an understanding that rain-fed cover crops can act like an insurance policy. 
If they're planted in the fall, they can keep the water in the ground when it falls as precipitation and provide many soil health benefits, as we've all discussed. And if it doesn't rain, well, you don't need to make an insurance claim. Your cover crop might not grow much, but you, you'll only be out of the cost of that cover crop seed. There isn't another major concern to have. And subsidies can help offset the risk of purchasing a cover crop that might not grow. And we list some of the services here that I'm sure many are familiar with. Um, I want to mention the California Department of Food and Ag's Healthy Soils program is going on right now and accepting applications only for, I think, another month or so. So if a grower is on board for this idea of a new insurance policy, they'll need to make some decisions like where to buy your cover crop. Um, how much are you willing to spend? What equipment do you need to plant it and then manage the biomass? Do you need to purchase it or can you rent it from, from someone? Um, and importantly, what risk does it pose to your operation given your crops, your irrigation system, and your practices? And lastly, uh, when to, to take action, when to plant and terminate your cover crops. We think that you need to understand a cover crop management calendar as closely as your regular cash crop. And there are many resources available to help you make those decisions. I want to mention the local resource conservation district offices that provide really invaluable insight and experience in cover crop planting, management, and monitoring. There's also many online resources, a few created recently by University of California researchers, um, including our team members. One example is the recently published guide to cover cropping in almonds that was created in partnership with the Almond Board of California. Um, these links are here and I think this presentation will get shared after we're done so you can access these. Um, and there's one in Spanish um, from the Almond Board coming soon. Lastly, for growers, there are several things that you can do to learn about cover crops and how they impact your soil health. You can simply go out and measure your cover crop height and biomass. You can collect it, dry it, and weigh it, um, either at home or send it to a lab. You can do simple, simple determinations of your soil aggregate stability. There are new phone applications that you can use to actually measure that um, from anywhere out in the field even. And there are simple tools you can use to measure water infiltration um, of your soil over time. And uh, our team has a upcoming YouTube video on soil aggregate stability that um, we just want to mention to be on the lookout for soon. So lastly, in addition to speaking directly to growers, uh, one of the goals of this webinar is to provide relevant information for folks who work amongst many farmers. Uh, specifically people involved in new groundwater sustainability agencies. GSAs are tasked with a enormously complicated job in balancing water budgets throughout the state. And we want to explicitly talk about cover crops in the context of this policy implementation because the research suggests that cover crops can help GSAs meet their management goals particularly if the cover crops are grown without irrigation and they're maintained for many years to improve soil function. We believe the science we presented here uh, supports that idea that they should be considered one of the tools in the toolbox of a groundwater sustainability plan. Just like a reservoir or a managed aquifer recharge basin, we can invest in our agricultural land to create infrastructure between almond trees and amongst the drip tape. Um, but if a GSA is to consider cover cropping as a management tool, it's important to consider what other tools that GSA is already using. So as GSAs implement groundwater use monitoring, uh, we've come to understand that some are using remote sensing tools to measure green pixels and hence groundwater use. And many growers um, and, and RCD folks, um, extension folks are hearing concerns that farmers may be penalized for their water use by growing winter cover crops. However, remote sensing models and techniques provide inaccurate estimates of actual consumptive water use in cover crop systems. So farmland with cover crops 
in these GSAs should be treated differently. Here we share several studies that support this idea. Um, we find that cover crop coefficients simply don't exist for most parts of the world, including California, and that's because they are difficult to calculate. There are many different kinds, as we've discussed today, different species, and they each respond differently to different climate and farm management uh, practices. Lastly, common methods used in the energy balance models uh, can have difficulty distinguishing between cover crop rows and bare ground. And this is really an important point because not all green pixels are traded equal. <laughs> the image on the right shows a remotely sensed NDVI photo from a drone flight last spring. And this vineyard had two different ground covers, a permanent cover crop on the left and a mix of bare ground and resident weeds on the right. But as you can see, these green pixels um, look identical. So given all this information presented today, we want to end with um, some definitive recommendations regarding cover crops and stigma. First, um, GSA should not treat winter cover crops as a net consumptive water user. Secondly, uh, before GSAs adopt remote sensing models or tools, um, there's more to the story. And there are two points regarding methods of quantifying on-farm water use. Um, we believe more ground truthing is needed to predict water consumption of certain specialty crops, in particular systems growing winter cover crops. Additionally, a systematic analysis of the uncertainties introduced into GSPs by using remote sensing will help gauge the importance of cover crop water use impact on a water budget. Third, we recommend well metering as the best approach to tracking water use to ensure accurate water accounting. And lastly, we believe the science supports the idea that cover crops can be used as a nature-based water management practice to help GSAs meet the goals of Sigma while improving the farm resiliency throughout California. And the idea of resiliency of the agricultural system is something that we want to end on. Here we show a drawing of the feedback loop between sunlight, energy, water, and carbon cycles. Over the past few centuries, um, human activities have led to reductions in soil carbon and moisture and increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide. And these phenomena are linked by soils and the human choices that affect soil function, which include farm management, um, like tillage and cover cropping. So how we manage our soils matter. Individual farms are part of a huge interconnected planetary network and every bit of water, soil and CO2 counts. And that's what we have for you this morning. Uh, we wanna acknowledge all of our financial support for our group's research activities and we have all of our email addresses on the next slide. And we welcome any questions on this material that we presented here today. Um, I wanna mention that a lot of what we shared has already published or is very soon coming online um, or is under peer review. So we would be happy to share any of that material with anyone interested. And I think we can open up um, uh, for a question and answers. Um, Alicia. Yep. Hey, Alisa, thanks everyone. I think most of the <clears throat> sorry, most of the questions have been um, responded by Daniel and I, but there is one that it says by Priscilla, Priscilla Baker. Uh, can you go back and speak to almond water use with bare soil versus cover crop? Uh, has this research been done? One slide was cover crop versus native vegetation, and I think we did that. Can you? I think that was the, the uh, uh, slide presented by Anna, right? Sorry, I, I didn't want to interrupt uh, you. No, we're, we're done. Uh, Brandy, uh, but... Um, it's okay. Yeah. I just wanted to um, remind everybody that as we transition into the Q&A portion, if you could uh, consider staying around afterwards, 
And then also, um, as soon as this question is addressed, we will also um, open the floor for anybody that wants to ask their questions. Just raise your hand and we'll call on you. And then we'll um, also voice some of the questions and answers that were in the Q&A if we have time afterwards, just so um, those that may not have access to the chat can hear that valuable uh, information. Um, all right, go ahead with your answer. Thank you. Um, well, I want to mention that all of our research that we shared was during the winter time and was looking at the water use of the cover crop itself. So these labels may have been misleading. Um, we were not actually measuring the water use of the almond system with bare soil versus cover crops. Um, that work is being done by UC Davis uh, research groups right now. So I think that, that that specific question will be coming soon. Um, there's a few different groups that are working on measuring ET of cover crop orchards. But what we have, what we're showing here is the soil moisture at the end of the winter time season. Um, I think that weeds, yeah, weeds and cover crops are different things. Um, I like to think of, instead of calling them weeds, uh, resident vegetation between trees can actually be a really um, low risk entry into the cover crop sphere. Um, if you just don't mow and let your cover crop grow in between your almond trees um, or let your resident vegetation grow, there can be a lot of benefit to the um, reduction of uh, evaporative loss, getting water in the ground and keeping it in place. Um, there are, are management issues that might come with that, but it may be a way to first enter the, the world um, by just letting something grow in between your trees. Purposefully planting a cover crop obviously takes more resources and time and careful management. So that's why we studied these two different systems. Additionally, our the orchards we looked at with them um, were doing so for much longer and they were older orchards. So the age of your trees is a really important piece of this answer and um, the the document that Sam shared about the best management practices addresses the importance of the age of your trees and your cover crop decisions. Um, before we answer another question, I just want to mention that uh, I had just looked in the chat and there's some questions around do and I see that Rich just brought that up as well. And this is a really, really interesting question. I hope that someone is putting out some do sensors in cover crop systems soon um, because we discovered this anecdotally in our research. Um, I would go out to fields and collect soil moisture data a few times a week and my pants would always be soaking wet as I was walking through winter cover crops. And there's really something to that, I think, and the cover crops ability to make use of the dew moisture in the air. And um, as far as I know, we don't have that information. Anecdotally, like I said, we have experienced that um, I don't even know what do moisture sensors exist, so if anyone in the, the webinar has that information to share with the group, that might be interesting to hear about. All right, so um, I don't see any hands raised, and yes, if just to side note, if we are addressing um, questions in the chat, if we could just read the question so everybody is aware of what the question is, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, there was a hand raised. Um, OK, first was Dan Daniel. Yes, I uh, just want to point out that uh, there is some uh, data collected on the um, do um, and, and uh, there are sensors available on the market that measure the leaf wetness and the time that it takes for, for the wetness to dry out and infer uh, the amount of water that can be captured by the vegetation on the ground. And uh, it's interesting because uh, this amount of water, if you measure ET, is thought of coming from the soil, but in reality, it comes from the air. And so it doesn't deplete soil water 
and is very important in coastal area or in area that have fog and dew. So I think this is a, this opens up a, you know a lot of a lot of interesting question about the you know the capturing effect of cover crop. Uh, the other point that I wanted to make is is that um, most of the research on cover crop is being done on non-saline or non-salt affected soils, but there's a huge amount of interest in seeing the effect of cover crop on saline and saline sodic soils because those soils are very difficult to manage in terms of compaction, defoculation of clays and and so it will be interesting to see also the effect of cover crop on saline and saline sodic soils. Um, just two points, uh, two clarification that I wanted to make. Thank you. All right, we have Carl Evers with his hand raised. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Good morning, everyone. Um, so the one slide that caught my attention was when it was called weeds. I like to call it as native vegetation. And what I've noticed over time farming almonds and walnuts, pistachios, is that the native grasses are more adapted to the harsh climate of California. It's dry, it's wet, and they grow. And when it's when it's a wet year, I agree, you can walk through there, you get wet, but most of the wetness on the grass that's coming onto your pants as you walk through the orchard is from the fog or the air. And I think it contributes con significantly. So I would really like to change it from weeds to native vegetation. And um, this native vegetation is adapted. It can germinate and complete its life cycle and then put its seed and biomass back into the soil, depending no matter how much rainfall there is, it always comes back. So to me, that's the toughest and most naturally occurring uh, source of biomass for the middles of your orchards. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Would somebody like to address? No, yes, well, well taken point. I think that's that, that's a good clarification. Thanks. Right, and yes, um, I also agree. Resident vegetation would be a great term because um, not all of the grasses that we see are native. All right, we have a few more hands raised. We might not make it to all the questions in the chat. So I believe we have recorded the transcript and this will be recorded. So let's now move to Kabir. Question, please. Hey, I know I just uh, add up uh, some of the, uh, uh, you know, the question raised by, you know, uh, Daniel and what they are talking about, like, you know, uh, salinity and sodic kind of situation. You know, once you put the cover crops in there, infiltration will be much higher. So the salt concentration will be much lower, you know, just uh, pointing out this one. And I also would like to, talk about this, you know, residence vegetation. And most of the resident vegetation actually in California, like, you know, 5% cover crops we are talking about, maybe 4% of them are resident vegetation. So we need to maybe do more research on that you know, to see, you know, how these things differ from just cover crop. In terms of economic benefits, you know, how much money we're spending on cover crop seed than just residual vegetation. And other things are, I would also like to mention, you know, whether you can see mixed cover crop, multiple species of cover crop compared to the single cover crops in the winter time. So these are just few points. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Kabir. Good seeing you. Yeah, nice seeing you. <laughs> Thank any response to his comments? Well, I'd like to uh, comment on Kabir's uh, a consideration that another point worth exploring is the uh, the gains that you reach in you might achieve in uh, leaching salt. Uh, insult impacted soil with and without cover crop because of the increased infiltration and improved soil water dynamics. And, and I've been uh, discussing this with several growers on the west side, uh, um, of this, the west, western side of the San Joaquin Valley, and they reported that uh, the effectiveness, but this is a 
this is not science-based data, this is perception, the effectiveness of salt leaching during winter time, so during dormancy is probably much more improved with cover crop um, and with the use of probably less water. So with this with similar amount, amount of water, you can probably remove more salts from the soil root zone with the cover crop. And, and I am seeing a, a nice comment from uh, Karen, uh, Karen Lowell from Salinas, California. It might be good if you can point us out or let us know this school data set uh, showing increased cell leaching. So please do contact us. I'll put some or we're going to put some of our emails there so you can contact. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I do see additional hands raised. I apologize at this time we are running slightly over. I encourage you to um, enter your question into your chat and then we'll ask if our gracious presenters would be willing to answer those and um, perhaps we can send that out along with the transcript. Um, Okay, so I just, this was a great uh, webinar with a wealth of information and I appreciate you all very much for taking your time out and sharing your knowledge with us and your expertise, um, not just with us, but really our whole community, our whole um, Soil and Water Conservation Society community. So thank you. Um, at this time, we will be transitioning um, before we end this recording, though, and I may lose some of you. I hope not. I hope you all stick with us, but I, I do want to encourage you all to consider becoming a member of our California Nevada chapter of the Swell and Water Conservation Society. Um, once you're part of the community, you can um, just keep this conversation going. And I know today we reached at least 100 participants or 100 people were involved with this webinar. So um, as we grow, we also increase our reach. So it's it's a great um, feeling to have that happen. So again, thank you all. At this time, we will be um, concluding our webinar, but please stick around. <laughs>